So I want to thank all of you for inviting me to be here. This is such a great opportunity. And believe it or not, I actually do have sort of a Columbia connection. Um, four years ago, my daughter attended her freshman year here at Barnard College, and I have been on the campus tour three times with many, many students. Um, and in the, I just feel like I kind of know where, I knew where, I know my west side. I was very excited to be able to stay on the west side again. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. I had a great time talking with Maurice this summer at MIT. Um, when people ask me what I do, I actually say I'm in the business of intelligent design using technology tools. And I use the word intelligent in front of everything that I say because I think that's the idea that I want to kind of communicate today. So three years ago, I decided to take a leave of absence from my tenure job at Pasadena City College and to go out and work for .com, lynda.com for that matter. I'd actually, I am the oldest living user of lynda.com. I'd been using it since 1995. <laughs> and I was the oldest living person at the company when I started working for them. <laughs> I'm actually older than Linda. Um, and um, it was really, really interesting to go from uh, a 15th century a model of education into a, a company that was trying to figure out its processes and its design and its, its ability to communicate it with its audience that was growing monumentally every single day. And while I was there in this trading places experience, I had sort of these three aha moments. And the first one was that I was all excited about working for a dot-com company and I thought this is going to be this active practice of questioning and observing and networking, experimenting. And when I got there, I realized that there were a number, numbers of these young, young people coming out of schools like Stanford and Columbia and, and brilliant kids, but they were clueless as to how to do these things. They were great subject matter expertise people who had all this great education and great scores, but they didn't really know how to step that fast and to, to, to adapt to this fast-changing environment. And it's a harsh environment. It's not easy to work at lynda.com. Linda herself says this is one of the hardest places to work at. The second thing was that I realized that there was something business really wanted. And it was helpful for me as a, a professor to hear what that was, to see what that was. And what they wanted was a track record that demonstrated discovery skills. And I'm going to be using the word discovery a lot. A possession of expertise and one knowledge, which we all know about from being at college. And breadth in a few and a passion to change the world and make a difference. And literally, these are the words you hear at this business. Now, I actually don't hear that that much on a campus, but you hear this in a dot-com company, and an expectation of excellence. So to work at lynda.com, to get an A at lynda.com, the CEO has to says, say to you, you've exceeded my expectations. And I realized it was through the language you were getting graded. But if somebody says, that's a great job you did, that meant a C. And if someone said, I really like the way you've connected on this project, I see you've made a few explorations, that's a B. And I realized there was a whole language in business that was grading. And I now use that in my grading thing at, at, at PCC. But this exceeding expectation was the A. And I thought, I've got to start using that again. I've got to get, start listening to this. The last thing that I realized that as I was doing, preparing this, I've been thinking about innovation for a long time, and I've there's a couple books I'll mention. But when I went to look, actually, I put the word innovation and university into Google search. And the only thing that came up were entrepreneur programs and MBAs. The only thing. I didn't see it in English. I didn't see it in theater. It didn't even show up in the art and design programs. It, didn't, it only showed up in this one thing. And I thought, oh, this must be, this must be just you know, part of the description of all entrepreneurs, an innovative fast track into business skills in a fast growing internet world, right? Because it, that was the only thing that showed up. And I was, and I, and I realized that, that it, at lynda.com and the other companies that I was working with, that it wasn't something that was just for entrepreneurs, that they expected every person at that company to have innovative skills. And it came back and it changed the way I taught. And what it made me think about was, was I teaching innovative skills? I still have to be an interaction design teacher. I still have to do my subject matter expertise. But I realized it was something I could teach students. So I'm totally a professor. Went back to the dictionary. Love my dictionary. I lived in Italy for two years, and I love my Latin. And, um, and what I was really 
I, I wasn't that impressed by the definition, but I was more impressed by the Latin, which means into the new. And I liked that idea because this was that, again, that idea of exceeding expectations of taking us forward into something, that elevating us and pushing us into a new territory, a territory that maybe, you know, we thought ended with going to the moon. But there's this other idea of what the internet's taking us into that's not a physical territory. So the next thing after that was, well, well who is an innovator? And so I'm, I'm actually going to put that question out to you right this moment. I'm, I, I, what do you, call out what you think an innovator is, some of you. Anyone got an idea of what they think an innovator is? I know it's early. <laughs> yeah. Yell something? Risk taker. Risk taker. Anyone else? Someone who says the crazy thing. Someone who says the crazy thing. Anyone else? Change agent. Change agent. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea. One of the very, and this is what's interesting about this, is that um, Walt Disney himself was one of the very first CEOs identified by business schools as being an innovator. And they, one of the big jobs of in an innovator is they're a cross-pollinator. And I loved this idea. Walt used to say, I'm not the creator of anything. I'm not the responsible agent for anything. You can't attribute anything to me. But what I do is go throughout my entire company, and I'm like a bee who takes pollen from one thing to the next to make sure that this big idea is interconnecting and networking. And I love the idea that the idea of networking occurred to him long before we even used it every day in our vocabulary, that he, that he called it cross-pollination. But maybe the 50s version of the word network is, in fact, cross-pollination, that finding those, those synapses, those intersections. And this is what really impressed me as I was doing that. So quickly, just to let you know, you're, you're pretty right on. But you've missed a few things. Infectious curiosity, discovery, delightful experiences, the delight of learning how to walk and stand up in the world. There should be this joy in this, 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 this wonderful sense of, wow. You know, endorphins should go up. There should be a bump. A creative catalyst, not necessarily ownership. So much of, of, of education and academia is about who owns what and, who, and how we attribute. But this one is not about this. This is this, this, this joy of being on the ride. The coach, the advocate. Like one of the things that was really missing at lynda.com was they were very innovative, but there were no advocacy. And one thing that teachers do very, very well is I'm kind of known as the teacher at lynda.com because I advocate. When I see someone doing something well, I don't mind saying at every meeting I go, that's the person who could bring this to this table. That's the person who could contribute this. And that wasn't in the language of the MBA students and the analysts and the, and the developers. A facilitator, a cross-pollinator, this idea, ideas being very at the root of things. So I like to talk about this, and this is an interesting slide, because basically this slide for me represents a time, really, it's when Steve Jobs failed. And he failed big time, and then he was invited back to Apple. And he came into Apple, and he um, had everybody in the company, because it was small at that time, it was at the $12 level, not the $600 level per stock, and he everybody was totally demoralized and he was very nervous about having his second chance at being back at Apple and he said to everyone and I'm going to quote let me just find this one little quote and then I'll quit reading to you the whole purpose of the Think Different campaign was that people had forgotten what Apple stood for, including the employees. So it was in this meeting with the employees that he came up with the idea of how to do the branding and messaging for Apple at that time from his own employees. And he didn't know them at all. He'd been out of the company for a while. And so he went around the company, just like Walt Disney, and he said to everybody, who are your heroes? And he started asking that question to have a dialogue with them. Because he didn't want to know where they lived or how many kids they had. He just wanted to, he, he was trying to have an idea dialogue. And he realized that the answer was, our heroes are innovators. We stand for innovations. And he went back to the advertising agency and he says, if you want to work at Apple, we expect you to be an innovator who wants to change the world. And it was out of this idea of how to get his company out of this, this moral dilemma, this, this malaise, 
that this campaign came. And what's interesting to me about this is for me, when I see this campaign, it still has a huge resonance for me. I don't know, does anyone else feel like that? It's, a, it's not um, a brainiac thing as much as it's this very emotional connection of inspired people that you'd like to know, that you'd like to be connected with, that you'd like to be in the presence of, that you have a story for each one of them as you see their pictures around town in big black and white pictures. So that idea of the ripple effect, that, that an idea can really carry out into the world and transform the way we think about things and the way we think about products and services. So it's a very strong, compelling idea here. So the book that I started reading this summer was The Innovative's DNA, and it's written by Jeff Dyer, Hal Gregerson, and Clayton M. Christensen. I'm, have all of you heard of Clayton M. Christensen? He's done a lot of books on innovation for MBA programs. And I'm an art and interaction user experience designer reading this, this book. And what was interesting about this book is that um, it got me really excited because it, it talked about the fact that you could that anyone could be an innovator that it that that was teachable and I that that really grabbed me so how many of you in at, at, at Columbia and other where other how many of you are from Columbia actually most of you yeah 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 most of you how many of you think you're an innovator now I, I ask this question all the time and it's it's actually amazing only a third of the audience ever answered raises their hand. One out of every three people think they're an innovator, and the rest don't. And I don't know if it's self-doubt or modesty or, <laughs> or what, but it, it, it's always interesting because you would think, for me, at the schools that I get to go to, I've visited over 60 or 80 colleges and campuses across the world and the United States, Princeton, Harvard, all the Ivy Leagues, that only one third raise their hand because I think of these schools as the most innovative leaders of knowledge and education and student success in the world. And so what this book does is it defines this role and it actually has a very long, long, long thing that you can take, but there's also this little app that they have, and I'm, this is so you have something to do while I'm talking. Um, there's this app where you can go to, I know you all have your devices with you. Uh, there's this little thing that you can take in less than five minutes, and so now when I teach, no matter what class I'm teaching, it doesn't matter if I'm teaching beginning design or art history or whatever, what, this is what I have everybody do the very first day to, to check what their innovation DNA is. And so I took this little test, and everybody at lynda.com just goes, they just, they just rolled over and laughed because they said, that's your job description. That's exactly what you do here. You need new challenges. You want to explore. You want to stay on top of things. You hate getting stale, blah, blah, blah. You, you go out and gather detail, and you come back to the company and say, if we did this, this, and this, it would make this happen. And they, they were just hysterical because they said, you have been trying for two years to write your job description when this is what it is right here. <laughs> Why aren't you using this? Um, then I did it with my students and I found out that, in fact, my students are often, there's another category which is called um, the experimental scouts. And most of my students are the experimental scouts. Now, if you buy the book, you can take the $100, $200 thing, you can do your whole division, you can take you know, a two-hour test. It's like taking an SAT test and find everything about you from you know, your kidney up to your brain about your innovation DNA. But this is a really fun thing to do with a class. And it starts this interesting conversation about one, what is an innovator. So students tend to be experimental. But people with experience tend to be conceptual. Ideas are what lead them as you gain maturity. So one of the other things that I talk about with my students is innovation is an investment in yourself, in others, in your organization from top to bottom. These three guys interviewed 50, they, inter they did a scan of 50 companies, 5,000 top executives in 72 countries. They got a pretty good sample of what was going on out there. And their number one thing is a company wasn't innovative if at the top, at the top level the CEO didn't demand a culture of innovation. It had to be something that permeated and which therefore came up with the word DNA. So another little test, because you gotta wake up guys. So one of the things that they talked about is that they found that the one quality, the discovery quality, that important word, that desire to discover, that all the CEOs who dis that scored high on this discovery matrix became what they called their, their quotient or their index for measuring innovation success or innovation premium. That the, the most successful companies and the companies that had been successful in the last five years and that they could predict in the next 10 years would be uh, innovative, would be the, the, the CEOs that had 
discovery, high discovery skills, which they call the discovery quotient. So who, just, I'm going to show you the top 10, but I wonder if any of you can guess some of the top 10. Anyone have an idea what top 10 innovation premium companies might be who will be innovative in the next five to 10 years? Google. Google? Google. Intel. 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 Apple? Amazon. Amazon. That is what everybody answers. Wait till you see the list. They're on the list, but there's number one, Salesforce. Apple's five. Google six. These are interesting things. Now, I want to talk about one in particular. I mean, number two is intuitive surgical. Hmm, that is not what most people think in the audience. Celgene, number four. Monsanto. But the one I want to talk about is number seven. Hindustan Lever Unilever. You know what they did? They wanted to sell environmentally correct household products to families in India. And it just wasn't working. They couldn't figure out a distribution model. And one of them said, well, we can't use the distribution model that we would use in the United States because they don't have the infrastructure for that distribution. They can't go online, the, the wives and the mothers and stuff. And one of the execs said, it should be like Avon. It should be like Avon. And they went out and started this grassroots things where there were, they went out to a woman in the community who became the cheerleader for the product, who invited everybody over for the coffee clutch or the tea clutch, what, the chai tea, whatever they do in India. And they, they started teaching and then the women could be making money by distributing it and sharing it with their neighbors. And it became a door-to-door, women-run business. It is one of the most successful uh, uh, businesses in India and it's run almost entirely by women who go door to door and actually become part of the company by doing it. That is innovation premium. Do you understand? It's not just that they had a great product. It's the whole concept about the delivery, the target audience, the user experience, and the way we communicate. And it needed to be communicated in this particular culture in an emotional way that, that, that the person talking about it could understand, not the way the CEO would talk about it. The other one, I know it'll be There'll be pl there are people who probably hate Monsanto and in this audience, and there are people who probably love them. But one of the things they've done is by doing these genetic genetically modified seeds is that they've also introduced, believe it or not, an idea about banking. Because they couldn't get these people to try these seeds because they didn't have enough money to buy seeds and tools. But if they gave them a $5 loan to buy the seeds and the tools that they needed, they could make $15, give $10 back to the bank to save. So in, in fact, Monsanto actually started this actually grassroots, they didn't understand the concept of banking because in order to do banks, you have to trust the banks, which now <coughs> Americans are going the other way on this one. But, but the idea here was they never gave their cash or their money to anyone. They wore jewelry, but they couldn't make money because they weren't saving to invest money. They only spent and bought what they needed. So this idea of banking was totally conceptual and totally abstract. And by doing this in Indonesia, they've done this experiment. It's actually increased the productivity of the rice products. They've now just done it with shrimp farming. And it's also part of, we've worked with the, they work with the USAID and a number of organizations, UNESCO and all over the world. But this is, a, this is an idea where maybe you don't like what Monsanto does, but the idea of introducing banking so that people could lift their lives up is a huge concept. And it came out of designing seeds. So those are two examples of what I call innovation premium. And I think you'll be, I was very surprised when I saw the top 10. It wasn't exact. They're not all big names. It's not Fortune 500. So as I said, one of the things about innovation is that it should feel like a room full of opportunities. And I'm going to demonstrate. I know we're streaming, so I'm going to go offline. But one of the things that I think happens to teachers, and I felt like it was happening to me, is that I'm talking, it's not even Sage on the stage. It's like you're like this, and you don't know that there's six doors behind you. That you're not opening any new doors. That you're actually in a room like this Columbia has infinite number of resources. Uh, we just heard the provost say that he would do anything that he could to make sure that ensure that there was student success and that you as the deliverers of student success and content and subject matter expertise have all the resources available. But I find that students and teachers are sort of sitting like this in school and they're only seeing the one thing in that one moment and not realizing or taking advantage of all those doors of opportunity. So in order to become innovative, you have to start thinking differently. And differently, any psychologist in the room, requires behavior modification. If we change our behaviors, we begin to act differently. And if we act differently, 
the people that we interface with every day change and transform around us, and that causes innovation, and we can start to make a difference. So it's really, really simple. And what's great about it in this book is that four of the five skills needed to be innovative are teachable skills. They're not something that you have to have 170 IQ to know. Now, associational thinking, I think of most professors having this, and they're experts at it. And do you know how many teachers don't talk about the idea of associational thinking with their students? They talk about their subject matter expertise, they talk about the summarization of their studies and their research, but they don't talk about that process by which they arrive at those ideas. So now that is part of my class. I wasn't teaching them what made me absolutely successful, what made me be able to go out to companies and all over the world and talk about education. The third, these were just easy. So if I question, observe, network, and experiment, I hope today, if nothing else, you'll get that these are teachable things, four teachable things, not requiring any knowledge of a fancy new software, not knowing code, not knowing how to use an LMS, not knowing seven passwords to get logged into the, the library, the LMS, the da 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 da. I know we're all supposed to be single sign on, but it's not exactly true. So um, this made me think very deeply about these. So the first one I'd like to talk about is association. And for me, this slide is really, really important because, of course, I love libraries, and I am the oldest living user of the lynda.com library. And one of the things that when I have always loved, my favorite experience at the library, is you go look for the book, and you get this little list, and you go to the shelf, and dang, the book you want's not there, but wow, there's three other gems. And you pull out that book and you open it up, you're just flipping through like a magazine, and wow, that's the aha kernel moment, right? And that's associational possibilities. So adjacent possibilities, are we doing this with learning, or are we showing them a bookshelf? Are we focusing like this, or are we giving them the bookshelf? So making connections across these seemingly unrelated things. It might even be, I love libraries, because you walk by a newspaper and a reference librarian who's, oh, reference librarians, I, have, I live with one, my sister's one, desperate to show you things, desperate to look things up, desperate to find five things that you never knew were connected to that. They, they should have been called, you know, kings and queens of networking. Um, and so the association is this really wonderful thing that happens. I'm going to share one um, actually, I won't show that. Sorry, I'm going to go lickety splitting around. So one of the ways that we can think of associational thinking that you all know about is the Renaissance, right? That is a perfect example, historically, of what associational thinking is. And don't worry, I'm going to give you my slides. Don't worry, I'm going to give you this, this whole thing you can have with all the links to the end. They're all annotated with a bibliography. And, and what I love about that is they think that the main reason, what do you think the main reason for the Renaissance happening was? Because the Renaissance, because that area of Florence was near two main seaports in the Mediterranean and not landlocked in the middle of Europe, they had a number of people in, coming in and out from a number of different cultures. And these rich families were listening to ideas from the Far East, from Africa, from the Mideast, from Northern um, England, which was in England at that time. And these ideas were percolating and people were talking about the different points of view, different points of view in a one location with a number of intelligent design-like thinking people is a perfect fertilization for this, this effect. Silicon Valley was not like this in the 60s. It was a bedroom community of Palo Alto and Stanford. But in the now, right now, it's a hotbed of innovation companies. And as your provost mentioned, ed tech companies is their hot new word. And then the last thing, with all we know about neuroscience, one of my most the most exciting thing to me that I've learned in the last two years is what's going on in neuroscience about learning. This is a brain on learning. It's lit up all over the place. When you're just listening, or just taking a note, or just focused on one thing, or driving, it's only like one or two parts of your brain are lit up, playing up on the freeway, you know, waiting for that exit. How did I get on here on the metro? Oh, that's my stop. You know, like, but when you're associational thinking, it's going like it's bouncing around, checking file boxes, looking in. It's multi-sensory. It's it's emotional. It's, a lot, it's stories, it's memories, it's all that you bring from all the experiences that you have. That is cool. 
that is a really neat thing to know. And you are getting to the point now where we're actually devi devising things that you can put on students' heads and teachers' heads and, and, and capture whether they're, not whether they're learning, but whether they're lit up. So this is a picture of T.S. Eliot. And you think, she's doing this thing on innovation and technology, and she's got a poet on there. But what I like is that he said at one point, and you have to know the place for the first time. I was working at Warner Brothers as a, I was job shadowing on all the creative technology positions at Warner Brothers, and I was put into the animation department, and they asked me to take an acting class as part of being an animator, and they made me do the ball test and all that stuff, and I was terrible at the ball. I had the slowest ball of all the interns, because um, timing and pacing is very difficult. But one of the things that they did in this acting class, they, of course, the new girl had to stand up, and he said, I want you to close your eyes, and go back, and I want you to show us what your first kiss was like. And um, on Saturday night, I was at the Santa Barbara Film Festival with Linda, and they were interviewing Daniel Day Lewis, and they asked him a question about gangs of New York and working with Martin Scorsese. And he could have said, you know, Martin Scorsese, great director, it was such a great opportunity to work with Martin Scorsese. And he closed his eyes, and his cool, dreamy, yes, I have a crush on him, Daniel Day-Lewis. He said, when Martin Scorsese called me on the phone, he told me about this idea that he had about New York, about telling a story about New York that he didn't think people knew. And the idea was so compelling that I wanted to know that man. I wanted to be with that man. I wanted to have coffee with that man. I wanted to have more conversations with that man. And he told me about the role, and I didn't know if I had it in me to do that role. And then he called me again, and I thought, I want to be with that man. Now, I love that story because it put him into that place that first time. He, was, he didn't say, oh, I love Martin Scorsese. He talked about that first moment of encountering Martin and this idea. And that's the first time feeling. Then another great guy, Einstein, this is him at Caltech, and I live about three blocks away from Caltech in Pasadena, and he said that often what we do, and not to discount your provost, but he named all the feature sets of the things that you're offering in the new world of education. He said MOOCs, he said online, he said distance learning, he said, I call that the feature set, right? Feature bullet, 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 bullet in the catalog. But he didn't define what, th what problem those were solving on your campus and why those are good solutions and why we're doing this. And that's one of my problems with distance education and all this technology. Are we asking the right questions? Do we know the problems that we're trying to solve? Or are we just trying to have the feature set that everybody else has? You know, because I go to a lot of these and I hear the same feature set. And when I'm at lynda.com, I hear the feature set of the library, and I said, but could you add on to that that it's good for learning? Because if you can't add it's good for learning to everything that you do at lynda.com, if we really are a learning organization, I could care less about the feature set. And we've tr I'm trying to change that idea, add for learning onto that idea. Because if it isn't for learning, then it isn't what we want to be doing. Finally, one of the things when we question is that I have a son who went to Princeton, sorry guys, and I have a daughter who's currently right now at Northwestern, and before I gave this, this, this speech, I said to my son, if you didn't know something in a Princeton lecture, and it's very like Columbia, these small, intel, you know, cream and creme de la creme, he says, mom, I never raise my hand if I don't know the answer. And I go, why not? He says, I'm not gonna let everybody in the room know I don't know something. I'm with the creme de la creme at Princeton. Why would I let anyone know I don't know something? And my daughter said, my daughter said, I never raise my hand, even if I know the answer. And I said, why not? You went to Barnard, you know what it's like to be at a girl's school. She says, if the teacher can't take an interest in me and see that my name's on the roll sheet and ask me a question that has something to do about me, I am not going to wave my hand for 40 minutes, and I'm going to use a bad word, for some douchebag to wait and call me. Because I'm not doing that. I'm not a pet trying to get my treat for a trick. So I'm letting you know that there's something going on in the classroom which I call the social phenomena, which is nothing to do with you, nothing to do with your desire for engagement, nothing to do with your desire to engage with the student, but actually about this fear of appearing stupid. So my theory is that we've raised 
the helicopter parents, me being one of them, guilty, we've raised a generation of students who have to be right. We've educated them to be right, to be correct, to be best. And the idea of an embarrassing moment, looking stupid, looking uncooperative, or staying quiet so that we aren't noticed, is more what they would do rather than not be right. Think about that. So now when I do critiques or I ask a question, silence is the great, this is really lousy. Listen, keep listening to the words, but silence in a classroom means nothing's going right. When you have a student present a project and someone says nothing, it means there's something really wrong. When everybody goes, ah, wow, something's really right. When you ask a question and no one raises their hand, something's really wrong. And th what it means is, there were really smart people, I love this drawing by SUNY Brown, but as you see, look at what we don't know, the monstrously large spot. And this is true on most of the campus I go, that in the pie chart, this terrible pie chart, what we don't know and what we don't know that's coming and we, what we don't know that's going to change in technology is very, very large. And at lynda.com, it's one of the worst problems that we have is that people don't ask the question, what is it I don't know? They just list the features, what they do know. Not the hard questions. So in, uh, the last thing in questioning is that you can do five questions. And Jeff Bezos and this guy that ran Toyota came up with this idea of the five whys. And there's a number of questions that you can ask, but the five whys, I'll go through it really quickly, is that you can't ask just one question, you have to ask a zillion questions. So Jeff Bezos heard that one of, he started these logistic warehouses for distribution. He realized that was the way to include small booksellers as well as large booksellers. And he heard one of his employees, his hand had gotten cut in a conveyor belt that the boxes go down to ship them off to FedEx and UPS. And he actually left his office in Seattle and went to the logistical warehouse and he said, I'd like to talk to that guy. I want to find out how this happened. He's a very hands-on CEO. And he said to the guy, so, so how did your hand get cut in the conveyor? He says, well, I have my lunchbox on the conveyor. Why? Why did you have your lunchbox on the conveyor? Well, uh, there's no place, we don't have lockers in this, this warehouse. There's no place to put our personal things. So why was it on the conveyor belt? Well, it was my lunch time, and there's no table for eating for us here, and I didn't have time to go out today because the weather, it's raining. And why was it still on? Well, we never shut down the machines because it takes too long to start the machines. And it went on like that. He asked the five questions. So he changed every single warehouse after this conversation. Now every logistical warehouse has a place for the employees to eat. Every person has a locker room or a personal space where they can put their things. And the conveyor belt system was changed so that it could be stopped on a dime so in case there was an inappropriate thing on the conveyor belt. So it wasn't just the safety of the, the warehouse. It was the actual everything going on. Observing. This is Charles Darwin. And what I like about this is the quietness. You have to be intensely observing. You have to use multiple senses. You have to use your listening, your touch, your taste, everything. And that observation is the big game changer. So Tata wanted to, uh, who lives in, Italy, in, in, in India, saw everybody, and if you've been to, I just got back from Vietnam last year, and everybody rides motorcycles. There's no cars. There's motorcycles in India and in Vietnam. And you see four or five, fam you see four people families on one motorcycle. And he felt like that it was a really, really dangerous situation, that how could a mother, father, and two kids be on a motorcycle? And he went back and he said, let's design a four-person motorcycle. And when they got done, they said, it looks like half a car. Why not? Why are we adding the other two wheels? Because they were assembling the motorcycles at the villages, not in the factories. They were taking all the parts and trucks to the villages and then selling the motorcycles there. So they decided they could make a car like that, that the parts would be separate, and then you assemble the car when you get to the village. So they did that, and it failed miserably. And he said, so we went to the village, and he said, you've got all these cars lined up. You've got the three cars in the village on Sunday when that's the market day. Why isn't it working? And they go, they have no money. So they set up another booth next door, and they had a financing booth. And still didn't work. Then they realized they didn't have insurance, and then they'd never driven a car, so they had driver's license. So there's, there's the car now, then there's the financing, then there's the driver's ed, 
then there's the get your test, and then there's drive out the door. So they've now set up five booths in a row so that the complete process of being able to own and run a car is possible. And it's done very, very well. And it's a $2,200 car called the Tato Nana. So one of the things he called this was not deja vu, but vu jade. It is something he'd seen and seen and seen his whole life. But what he did is he kind of pushed himself out of the rut and looked at it in a different way. He pushed himself out of his comfort zone to see it in a new way. Networking. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of networking we do at college. Almost every CEO I've talked to, the great CEOs, have spent a year out of country living, doing a job somewhere else. Um, Jeff Benef Benioff of Salesforce at one point decided to take a leave of absence from uh, Oracle and he went to India and lived for a year, came back to Hawaii on the way back and while he was swimming with the dolphins thought, you know, I'm, I think the most impressive company is Amazon.com, I don't really sell things, I'm, in, I'm a businessman and he got the idea for Salesforce. But if he hadn't left to go out and have that time to have his in the bathtub eureka moment, only it was in Hawaii with the dolphins, <laughs> moment, he wouldn't have been able to do that. So the kind of network I'm talking is not social networking, not resource ne networking, but do you attend two conferences a year? Do you have meetings? I have book club, my 10 women that live in the peaks. Do you, do you do other things where you can hear other voices? Do you have a place where someone can be your devil's advocate and reject your ideas? that you're not being told every all day long you're wonderful? Do you have a place where you can hear a different voice, where you can talk about an idea that's outside of the company, not in the bubble of Columbia? Because we live in bubbles, and they get really tough. And we can't get outside them because we're so in them all the time. And in reality, collaborative ne networks aren't that simple to do, and you have to be very, very active. But these same 50 top CEOs, every one of them had spent out of country, every one of them was in a group of dissimilar people, and in fact, that's one of the ways that the TEDx conferences got started, was this idea of different minds getting together to have a point in time once a year to share something. And that's, as you know, a very popular idea, but that was a model that a few CEOs came up with. I just finished my first MOOC at Stanford. I took crash course on creativity. I want to let you know that 75% of, of it was painful and awful and terrible. <laughs> but I finished the first MOOC that I've ever, third one I've joined, first one I've finished. But one of the great things that came out of this MOOC was that we were asked to do a project at bre on bread. And believe it or not, uh, at that time, you guys were suffering the effects of the sandy storm. And you may say to me, well, does, what does bread have to do with the sandy storm? We were to interpret bread in a new way, to look at it for the first time. And my group, which was, I made my students do this. I said, we have to have this MOOC experience as part of our interaction design class. In order to understand it, you have to be in it. And they said, we just hate this. We hate the feedback. We hate the people. We can't find the people. We can't find the projects. There's a lot of not being able to find things. And what we did, though, is as soon as I said, let's do the bread project Let's do it like a text message. Let's call it Bread for Life. All of a sudden, we coalesced. All of a sudden, we had a reason to be. All of a sudden, we had a metaphor for giving back life and a way that we could do it. So that week, we contacted, we emailed. There were, at that time, about 6,000 people in the class. It went from 30 to 6,000 in about three weeks. Uh, we contacted probably 3,000 people within the class. And through our own social networking, we probably did another uh, 3,000 people, and we think we raised over $2,000 by doing this campaign in one week. So that's what can happen with an, uh, a very um, innovative idea, is to get right in there and do something and, and, and respond in that emotional way with all the resources that you have available. Experimenting. Create new experiences, pile new ideas. I could give you a whole bunch of words. Deconstruct, rebuild, remake, prototype, iterate. Any words you want to use, take it apart, put it together again. Undo, redo, try it again, do it once, do it twice, do it three times. Uh, add that back in. Don't do a paper once. To view, I have never presented anything to the CEO that three people haven't looked at or three groups haven't looked at. Are we allowing our students to have that chance of feedback, feedback, feedback all along? And finally, remember that it isn't easy to stay on top of being innovative. What's interesting about this timeline is it ends. This is Sony. You can't think of a product that Sony's done since uh, 2009. That's what happens if this stops. 
That's what could happen at Columbia or Harvard or Princeton or Stanford if you don't stay on top of these ideas. So try out things, prototype, do a lot of things. Because if you don't, there's sharks around that'll eat you up. It's a very hard thing to take on top. So knowing that everyone is everyone's job, I wanted to tell you three key stories. Pixar is my favorite company, a business I'd like to show. And their, their uh, motto is fail fast, but fix it together. Reward risk. So they've had more successful animation films in a row, more successful feature length films in a row than any other film company. And they believe in three big ideas, a free flow of ideas, constant interaction, and everyone is in the same building. And the way they did is they took an old, age-old idea. There's a reason that there's the commons. The original New York Central Park was for the commons. It was for the domesticated animals to be protected by the community so that the wild animals couldn't get it, so that they could share their resources, so that they could have, for these terrible winters, the things that they needed. It's the idea of the commons. But it also became the intellectual commons, it became the creative commons, it became the emotional commons for when they needed support. So they built this thing, and the women all hated it because the bathrooms, you had to leave your office and go to these bathrooms. But in fact, one of the women said, my most important conversations are my hallway conversations. And the, the, the whole spirit of Pixar's in, in that idea that I might pass a developer as a designer or an animator as a computer science, that there are going to be these hallway conversations. And on the second level, they actually conduct courses. So it's really this very hub, very open space that, they're, that they, you can see. And as you can see, it looks nothing like a sage on a stage type room. The other thing they do is they have brutal critiques early early, early. We often in education, I think we're at fault for critiquing at the end of the project instead of the beginning of the project. And it takes time to critique at the beginning. But if you add that in, guess what? There's always a third that's going to get that A. You know that from teaching and working with people. There's always a third that gets it. Third said you were innovators, right? But what about the third that don't make it through that? You do the, fa you do the fail early. You give feedback as a community. Fix it. You do that three times, guess what? That person's getting at least a B. I just did this experiment for the last two years at PCC. My uh, attendance rate has gone up to 85% in my class. I've only had, in a community college, you can drop out any time. In my last four semesters, only one or two people have dropped out, and it's for personal reasons. And the grades have gone, my whole grades thing has shifted up because we're going for excellence, not the big bar curve. We're going for excellence. You do it till you get it as good as it gets, in the time allowed with the tools that we have, with feedback from all people. Finally, NOCA, a different type of high school. There's no chairs, there's no long lectures, there's no note notebooks. It's a high school, but it was a, a book a school that John Lehrer wrote about in Imagine, and it's about a creative community. Not one ego taking it, but creative community, and about sharing ego to be more creative. So there are, everyone agrees that creative is a key skill. If our graduates are going to succeed in the real world, then they have to be able to make stuff. Their neuroscience says your brain lights up bigger when it's doing something than when you're passively receiving something. So this school is like do, do, do. Or it's like they wear it on their t-shirts. Um, they also do a lot of interesting things. They talk about rigor. They talk about the 10,000 hours that we hear from Malcolm Gladwell. They talk about skills and mastery of skill sets. They talk about presentation techniques. And people are grouped according to skill levels and not according to age. So you could have an eight-year-old violinist player with a 16-year-old violinist player in this school because that's the level at which they perform. And finally, a kind of Renaissance man. I don't know if have any of you heard of a Russ Lieberman Aiden. We all want him. Um, when you read his bio up here, you'll see that every school, every Ivy League claims he's done something for them, including Google. Uh, but he worked with Google on the project where they were searching for words and then taking that word search to create algorithms to see how culturally the words were coming and going within our culture and what that meant in shifts and thoughts about our attitudes towards words and the way we interpret words. He just did that for a pro bono side project while he was getting his doctorate degree. <laughs> um, what's interesting about him is he says, boredom is his key that innovation is gone. If he feels the sense of boredom, then he knows he's not being innovative. It's a tremendous warning sign. And he's, here's his solutions. Wonder, that idea of delight, creating new things, invention, irresistible idea. And he says, in academia, the real threat to innovation is that we do everything takes forever. 
We have three-year projects, 15-week courses. It's all about 10, 12-year doctorate process. So he said, that's a killer. And what he does is he inserts lots of small challenges and innovative projects in between that just interest him. Things he can do, like the bread projects, things he can do in one or two weeks. He says, if you don't change up the time factor, you can't be innovative. You've got to keep yourself, it's like exercise. You can't just do sit-ups every three years. You've got to do it every day. So he says, he, he really exercises his innovation capabilities by doing a lot of pro bono and interesting sideline things. IDEO, if I'm sure you've heard about them, they're at the D School at Stanford. This is, as you can see, qu clearly matches very similar to the four verbs that I give you. Observe, question, observe, network, brainstorm, and prototype. But one of the things I've gathered, I've done two workshops with them, is that the, the groups have to be small. You can't do this with 25. So my success, my great success, which will cost you no money and will delight everybody who likes office supplies is three to five people with post-it notes three to five people with colored post-it notes. And we just brainstorm and pull them off and put them up and tear them up. And you've got 45 minutes. Time it, small groups, small. Have them present right away from the iPad. Make it instantaneous. Put a pressure on them to go up and tell about an idea, get the feedback, get suggestions, go back to the drawing board. You can do this all in 45 minutes. You could at least use one class time to check in with your students on this idea of how to do associational thinking and how to do this process. So my last one I'm going to end with was how to make your students be more innovative. I do a couple of examples I want to give you. On the first day, I do a design a name tag. I've done this with all different kinds of classes, regardless of whether it's a design student or not. And they have to put a verb on the name tag. They put their name in the verb. And they have to be able to say to me why you and this was, I did a project, I did this project at Shiat Day for lynda.com, and my verb was command Z, I was undo girl. My, as you can tell, conceptual innovator, right? I'm to undo and to think of it a different way. Uh, I'm the iterator, I'm the prototyper, so mine was undo. But it builds trust, it's not a project that they're going to get a grade on and fail, it doesn't have anything to do with the SAT, they don't have to tell their parents about it, and it's a way to get a discussion that's not about what sorority you're in, what dorm you live in, or what city you came from, or how many classes and units you've taken and what scores you got in, to get into Columbia. It's about an idea about yourself. It's about self-identity and self-reflection and being able to talk about your aesthetic value, your psychological values, and your emotional values. I also have them do a project. I like to take, I like to bring the real world in. And this is a project they do at Autodesk. It's, it's very famous. We do the marshmallow project. Um, you do it again in 45 minutes. It's really cheap. It requires 20 spaghetti, two marshmallow, a piece of string three feet long, and a piece of tape three feet long. They hate it. It's in small groups again. Again, a lot of this I do the first two weeks in lots of small groups with different groups each time. You're not with the same group. And what I want you to see is there's first place. It's only two, that's two feet eight inches. When kindergartners did this, they'd made something that was four feet tall. When, when CEOs did this with their executive assistants, they did something four feet tall. And when architects and engineers paired together, they did something four feet tall. This is my design students who've been in design school two years. They got two feet eight inches, but at least they're stood up. There were lots of these, tall but not working. And I want you to show you the failure group. How could you tell that's a failure group? They're not looking at each other, there's no dialogue, and they're all looking down at their hands. They, when I asked them, because we interview each group, where were your successes, where were your failures, they said, we were unable to talk to each other, we, wouldn't, we, didn't, we tried to do it separately. This group won because one girl said, we forgot about the weight of the marshmallow. Let's stick the marshmallow on and keep testing every minute. And the minute they started doing the testing with the marshmallow, it changed their design. This group never tested with the marshmallow. Flop. <laughs> Another thing that I do is I give challenges. And I do this with all my classes. I give them the YouTube you teach. They have, I do no instruction on iMovie, no instruction on YouTube. They have to put a five minute teaching video on YouTube by themselves. They have five days to do it. I just gave the assignment on Monday. When I go back on Monday, there's gonna be all these YouTube. I love this email that I got from a student. I have 200 clicks on my YouTube video. 200 people have never looked at anything I've done in my entire life. You made me feel good. And I wrote back, 
You've exceeded my expectations, Alex. The fact that you've taken this project beyond and it's meaning something to you beyond this class is all that I care about. That is exceeding expectations. We do a lot of what we call question storming. And our new whiteboard is our cell phone and markers. And we just draw like that. But then, what is the deliverable? So we took those ideas that are on the board, we all took a snapshot, I sent them out to Keynote and PowerPoint, and I said, come up with a deliverable for what we just drew today. So we spent two and a half hours on that discussion, and this is what they handed back to me the next day. This is the kind of thing that makes innovative people get their ideas done. And finally, doing wireframes and doing a lot of other things that, that, that they can do. So this is a project I do in lynda.com. I like to teach JavaScript. I'm almost done, believe it or not. Um, and one of the things that we do is we use these tutorials, but they can't do any tutorial the way it's been done. And this is a, just a slideshow. You've seen JavaScript slideshows. It's at the top of every website today. And so what I've done with this project is <clears throat> I've actually, I'm going to just go out for a second here. Pull it up. I talk about storytelling and that slideshows are really and that scroll started in China. And it's the ability to use the scrolling idea that we could have timelines, that we could have flip books, that we could have all kinds of things. And I ask each student to come up with a point of view for this project. And this student had been to the Charles Schultz Museum. And he says, I came into the room and I decided to take four pictures, one from 100 feet away, 75, 50, 25, and close up. So his slideshow became a move through the room. Another student decided to tell, um, a, do a teaching lesson. And Pat was with me today. She actually did this. Uh, she did a story where she actually tells a story with the slideshow being a way to put images that connect to a story because we all know that if you add extra sensory, you can remember that story. And it goes back to Nara to our uh, National Archives, which we share because we're all citizens of the United States. And finally, a third student said, I want to tell a personal story. Uh, she had a cousin who had lost his hearing, and she decided, to, and then as an adult, with the advances in medicine in Mongolia, was able to have um, an ocular uh, ear transplant, and she made a continuous drawing, as, as her culture in China had done, of the idea of this new thing being implanted into the ear of someone and she tells a story that's an interactive story through this idea of the ear implant and having hearing for the first time. Now that's three different students and all I showed them was a slideshow of different cities in Europe. But the idea of taking storytelling and inventing memories and experiences around, just the way Steve Jobs did that with his, we talked about that Steve Jobs story, makes a difference in how we present our ideas. So my final takeaways with you is this is a big topic, it's, it's everywhere at schools, that one of the things that students are notoriously bad at is time management, start doing things like this. We don't call it failure, we call it risk taking, and if the risk isn't worth it, you've only spent 40 minutes, go back and do it again. So wherever there's a diamond, we put that diamond in there and that's the decision, are we ready to go forward or we, should we go back and relook, or should we go outside and get more feedback, more resources? And they don't know how to do this, believe it or not. <laughs> so having this visual way of saying, this is a spot where you should stop in the project, get feedback, look at your resources, evaluate, rather than note, notice you don't get to final iPad app without having three points along the way where you have to make this decision-making process. That's how I reward risk and how I eliminate the word failure. And this is how you get people coming to you off, off office hours and emailing you at 3 a.m. on the wiki space. And it's all good. It's all good. And that's where you get the delight at the end. But notice it's a very, qu it's a very quick iterative process. It's not two weeks. It's not 15 weeks. It's an ongoing process. Um, so this rubrics, I make them design their own rubrics for self-evaluation and put it in front of their projects to see if they're communicating with their target audience and if they're doing readability and if they're doing, you know, all the different things that they, th the criteria. And then you get things like this, which are infographics. These are intelligent designers taking data visualizations from primary sources. And these were students who only knew Photoshop and now they can t t t tell meaningful stories using data. So what, because that's what we're all about right now is can you tell stories with the data that you collect? That's what we do as educators. So the last thing I do is we create a student um, 
what we call the innovation bylaws. And we take those, those four words that are teachable and we try to find things that we can do in the classroom that illustrate those things. I'll give you my bylaws, but these are great ways to allow that. And notice that all of the key things are in there. It's higher ed challenge to blur the boundaries inside and outside the school and achieve this cross-pollination. Then your feature set will make sense if this is what they're achieving. This is the big umbrella idea that you need at a Columbia or a Harvard or a Stanford. Creating cross-pollinated centers, creating projects where students and teachers can work in a different way that's not geo-based, that's not online all by themselves, but where they can have these hubs of activity. There's new approaches to engineering, there's people now talking not creating innovators but creating innovation. The D Schools offers a free 30 minute, 45 minute lesson on how to jumpstart a class with a video and all of the ancillary materials. It's really, really fun. You can do it with teams of work, teams in your organization, teams of HR, with your own students. Again, it's a 45 minute process, it's available to you. And people all over the world are doing this. We have to all join in on this. So I'm asking you to think different, to act different, and change the world and exceed my expectations. Thank you all for, thank you so much, thank you.